ladies and gentlemen. The story you are about, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Monday, April 20th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of traffic division, hit and run felony detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Calfee. My name's Friday. An aching wisdom tooth had kept me awake most of the night. I had an appointment with a dentist and I was trying to stop the pain until then. I wasn't having much luck. Hi, Joe. Good morning, Frank. How's tooth? Not much better, still aching. Well, it's rough. And a lousy thing kept me awake most of the night. You check with that dentist I told you about? Yeah, I did. He says the wisdom, too. This one right up here. Let's see it. Well, it's this one here. Well, don't you want to show me? No, not particularly. Well, I'd like to see it. Why? Well, Joe, I know a little about wisdom, do you? Yeah. Well, anyway, the dentist says it's got to come out. I'm supposed to see him this afternoon. Joe, my sister had the same trouble. Is that right? Yeah, she had him out. Wisdom teeth. Really hurt. Impacted. You know what that means? Jammed right up in there. Just hanging onto that jawbone. Yeah, I don't know. Had to pull him right out. Hurt terrible. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Turn around this way, will you? A little more. Now, turn the other way. Yes, sir. Well, what's the matter now? Puffy. What? Your face is all swollen. It's puffy. Yeah, well, it didn't look that way to me in the mirror. You take my word for it, Joe. Face is swollen. Right there, see? Puffy. Yeah, it sure is tender. I imagine it is, Joe. It sure is funny about wisdom teeth, isn't it? What's that? Well, how some people never do get them. I never did. Isn't that right? Yeah. I got all the rest. No wisdom teeth. My sister had them, though. Yeah, you told me about that. She had them pulled. And that's another funny thing. What? Well, even after she had them taken out, she could still feel them. She could, huh? Yeah, for five or six days, they still hurt. This is after she had them pulled? Yeah, five or six days. I forget exactly how many, but they still hurt. They weren't there. Still hurt. Funny, isn't it? Yeah, that sure is. Well, don't you worry about it, Joe. The old doc will yank them right out. You'll feel a lot better then, too. Sure. Much better. Yes, five or six days. Still hurt. Yeah, did you see the skipper this morning? Hmm? Oh, yeah, I ran into him down the hall. Got something here we're supposed to check out. Now, what do you got? Dead body report. What's the story on it? Well, the victim's Edward Raymond Stokes, 732 Delano Street, apartment two. His body was found in a gutter near 63rd in Vermont. Three o'clock this morning, no witnesses, only one piece of evidence. Yeah. Skid marks near the body, that's all. Parent hit and run. Where's the body now? Neighborhood mortuary out there. Emerald Hills Funeral Home. One of the deputy coroners handled the body, a fellow named Jonathan Larimore. Anybody claim the body yet? No. Okay, you ready? Yeah. The skipper says if we need any help, Rogers and McClendon are on hand. That's fine. I don't know, how do we manage to draw all the choice ones? Do you know? I guess we live right. Huh? Skid marks and a dead body. Yeah. Well, guess we better get on it, huh? Right. Hey, what time are you supposed to see the dentist? I'm supposed to call him about 12.30. He'll tell me then. Doesn't look like we'll be able to make it now, does it? You should take care of that, Joe. Sure is funny. What's that? My sister. Same thing. Had him pulled. Her wisdom teeth. Five or six days later, they still hurt. Really tough. Five or six days. Yeah, you told me. I remember. You should try to get to that dentist today, though, Joe. You really should. Well, the way you lay it out, it really doesn't make much difference, does it? Huh? I still got five or six days. <laughs> Thank you. 
8.33 a.m., Frank and I drove out to 63rd in Vermont and rechecked the spot where the dead body of Edward Stokes had been found. According to the report, the body was found two feet west of the Easterly Curb and 32 feet north of 63rd Street on Vermont. We examined the skid marks closely. They showed definite signs of being a lot older than 24 hours. The consistency of the rubber was weak, and there were heavy dirt smudges over them, indicating more wear than they could have possibly had since the estimated time of the victim's death. We got back in the car and drove to the Emerald Hills Funeral Home at Vernon and Denver Avenue. It's a nickel an hour, gentlemen. Huh? Used to be pennies. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Did you ever notice this about funeral homes? What's that? Well, they put awnings over the windows, but they never open the drapes. Yeah. Did you ever wonder about that? No, not particularly. <laughs> Sounds like a funeral going on, doesn't it? Yeah. Feel hurt? Yeah, a little bit. Feel swole, too. Service, gentlemen? Police officers. We'd like to talk to a Mr. Larimore. I understand he's a deputy coroner. Yes, I'm Larimore. You came about the hit and run victim. Yes, sir, that's right. This is Officer Smith. My name's Friday. We'd like to check the body if we could. Certainly. I understand you moved the body from the scene of the accident here to the mortuary? Yes, that's right. Early this morning. Unusual case. Why do you say it's unusual, Larimore? Well, here. I've got it on the report. You can see for yourself later. Yes, sir. The victim's knee has a single clean cut. Also, the wounds on the head. I've never seen any like them in hit-and-run cases I've been called on. You don't think the victim could have been killed by a hit-and-run car, is that it? No, I don't say that. It's possible that it might have been a car. Well, let's say it's not very probable. I see. Has anyone at all inquired about the body, Larimore? No one, no. It's funny. Would you excuse me for a moment, please? I have to check down the hall. I'll be right back. Be right back. You can see the body then, if you like. Thank you. Well, yeah. where do we start? I don't know. Maybe we won't have to. What do you mean? Well, another lead like this, and we'll turn it over to homicide. Officer, there's a young lady outside, Miss Fuller. Yes, sir. She wants to claim the body. The girl was shown the body. She identified it as that of Edward Raymond Stokes. She gave her name as Marion Fuller, the victim's fiance. After she recovered from her shock, she asked if she might sit down for a while and rest. How long did you know Edward Stokes, Miss Fuller? About six years, on and off. We've been together pretty much the last couple of years, though. Oh, my head. Terrible headache. Would you mind telling us exactly what happened while you were with Stokes last night? Everything you can remember. Oh, I can't think. This headache's killing me. Well, we should try, Miss Fuller. It's important. Well, Eddie and I had dinner at the Spanish Oven, a place down on South Pig. That was about a quarter to eight. Then we drove out to the Brown Barrel on Vermont. You know, the bar I told you about? Well, Eddie and I go there most of the time. We stayed there and drank and played a little shuffleboard. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we stayed a little too long. We drank a little too much. I started talking to this fellow next to me. Eddie got sore. He always got jealous when he was drunk. Poor Eddie. Did Eddie fight with this other man, Miss Fuller? No, I stopped him. That made Eddie mad. He never could drink right. Always wanted to pick a fight. Who was the other man, do you remember? No, I don't. I guess I had a lot to drink, too. Just some guy at the bar. Oh, this headache. Well, this won't take much longer. Just a few more questions. Would you hand me the rest of that water, please? Sure. Thanks. Would, would one of you have a cigarette, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Here's a match. I don't believe you got that. Thanks. Would you like to go on, Miss Fuller? What happened after you broke up the argument between Stokes and the other man? Same old thing. Eddie threatened to beat me up. He'd done it before, too, plenty of times. Yeah. Well, around 1 o'clock, I got to feeling sick, so I went outside and sat in the car. Guess I must have passed out there. In your car? No. I guess it belonged to one of the fellows in the bar. I passed out, that's all I remember. Well, did you sleep in the car all night? No. I guess whoever owned it drove me home. Well, how'd they know where you lived? I don't know. Must have been one of our friends. 
I don't remember anything until this morning. They phoned me up and said Eddie was dead. Mm -hmm. Who phoned you, Miss Fuller? One of our friends. I don't remember. Oh, I had a rotten headache. Now, oh, come on, you can do a little better than that, can't you? I tell you, I don't remember. I had a hangover. My head was jumping. They phoned and told me Eddie was dead. Somebody ran Eddie down. They found him in a gutter and he was dead. Poor Eddie. All right, Miss Fuller. I wonder if you'd mind coming with us. Where are we going? Downtown. We'll have a stenographer take your statement. We have a few more questions to ask you. Oh, look, can't you leave me alone? I got a terrible hangover. I never had one as bad as this before. Neither has Eddie. Come on, let's go. On the way back to the office, we stopped at a drugstore and I picked up a box of aspirin. The wisdom tooth was giving me trouble again. The clerk at the soda fountain fixed something for Marion Fuller's hangover. We continued to question her, but she gave us only one additional piece of information. The victim, Eddie Stokes, had been married before and divorced. His ex-wife lived out in the valley with their two children, and on several occasions she came to see Stokes at the Vermont Avenue bar when he failed to make the monthly payments for the support of the children. Each time they had argued bitterly. <laughs> We had a police stenographer take the Fuller woman's statement, and then she was released. 10.45 a.m., Sergeants Rogers and McClendon were assigned to check out the Vermont Avenue bar where Stokes had last been seen alive. Frank and I drove out to the valley to the home of Catherine Stokes, the victim's former wife. We told her what had happened. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Excuse me, I can't help it. It looks like it could have been a hit-and-run driver, ma'am. We've been assigned to investigate. Oh. I don't think I'll be able to help much. Eddie and I have been divorced almost five years now. I see. The judge said he could visit the kids on weekends. They never came around, though. Eddie never had any feeling for the kids. How many times have you seen your ex-husband in the last five years? I'm not sure. About a dozen times, I guess. Well, when did you see him last? Last week, I think it was. Uh, yes, Thursday of last week. He hadn't sent any money for the kids' support for three months. I hated to chase after him like that. Always so embarrassing. There wasn't anything else I could do. Where did you meet him, Mrs. Stokes? At that bar he used to hang around. It's over on Vermont. It's called the Brown Barrel or something. He was drinking quite a bit, always drinking. I asked him for the money. We argued as usual. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything I can get you? I think there's a bottle of beer in the icebox. No, thank you, ma'am. Do you happen to know anybody by the name of Marion Fuller? Yes. Eddie mentioned her. She's no good. What does a man see in a woman like her? Do you know anything about her at all? No. Whenever I saw Eddie, he'd mention he was running around with her. I guess he wanted to make me jealous. I only pitied him. Now, can you think of anything at all that might possibly have a bearing on his death? I guess not. Eddie was probably drinking, wandered into the street, and the car hit him. I don't know. Oh, there's the bakery wagon. I've got to get some bread and a few things. Would you excuse me? I think that's about all, don't you, Joe? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to leave you one of our cards, Mrs. Stokes, in case you want to contact us for any reason. Yes, all right. You know, it was so wonderful when we were married, Eddie and I. My folks gave us this house as a wedding present. We got wonderful presents. That's so? We had everything he wanted. A car, nice house, the kids. It was wonderful till he started drinking. Then everything went. His job, everything. It started all of a sudden. I never knew why. Yes, ma'am. How do men get that way? How do they start? I don't know, ma'am. We only see a part of it. Yes? When they finish. Twelve noon. Frank and I drove back into town to Vermont and 63rd Street for a meet with Sergeants Rogers and McClendon. They told us they checked out the bartender who'd been on duty the night before and also seven of his customers. Their stories were almost identical. Each of them remembered seeing Eddie Stokes at the bar. Each of them remembered he was playing shuffleboard, that he was drinking heavily, that he left the bar at about 1.45 a.m. All of us had the idea that for some reason the bartender and the customers were lying. In most cases, it's hard to find two witnesses who tell identical stories, let alone seven. For the rest of the afternoon, Rogers, McClendon, Frank, and I spent our time canvassing the neighborhood in the vicinity of the Brown Barrel Tavern. 4.45 p.m., we checked the proprietor of a small butcher shop two blocks down the street from the tavern. Yes, sir, gentlemen, can I help you? Police officers, you Mr. Murray? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask a few questions. Sure, glad to help if I can. You ever been in the Brown Barrel Tavern just down the street a couple of blocks? Brown Barrel? Yeah, I go there all the time. When was the last time you were there, Mr. Murray? Last night. Wife and I went to the movies. We dropped in at the barrel on the way home for a beer. I see. About what time was that, would you know? Well, pretty close to two. 
What's the matter, some kind of trouble? Did you notice anything unusual while you were in there? Anybody fighting or arguing, something like that? No, we were only in there a couple of minutes. Well, now that you mention it, there was something funny happened. What was that, sir? Well, the bartender, Carl, and half a dozen of the neighborhood gang were back in one of the booths talking together. They seemed kind of nervous. None of them seemed to be having a good time. Yeah. The wife and I yelled hello at him, but they kind of gave us the go-by. Then this drunk came up to us. I never saw him before. Don't know who he is. I see. But say, excuse me, I've got an order to get out. Would you boys like to step back here? We can talk. Fine, thank you. Yeah, this drunk comes up to us and he whispers to me, say, you better get out of here. There's been a fight. Well, I don't pay much attention to him. He's pretty drunk. I'd hardly understand him. I guess they had lots of fights in there anyway. Is that all he told you? There'd been a fight? Yeah, that time. But he came back a couple minutes later and whispered the same thing. You better get out of here. There's been a fight, he said. Wife and I just laughed at him. I see. He said, I know all about it. The guy's been murdered. Frank and I went back to Homicide to turn the case over to them. They asked us to handle the investigation for another day because they were short of men at the moment and because there was still a big doubt as to whether or not Eddie Stokes had really been murdered. Actually, the only solid lead we had was the second-hand testimony of a drunken witness, that and the deputy coroner's doubts that Stokes was actually the victim of a hit and run. We brought Marion Fuller back in and re-questioned her. She stuck to her story. She didn't remember anything. She was released again. It looked like we were in for a long night. I just talked to that butcher's wife, Mrs. Murray. Yeah, what'd she have to say? Asked her the same questions we asked Murray. She couldn't add much. Same story. Well, I don't know. It's got me. We don't know it's murder. We don't know it's a hit and run. I'm about ready for my vacation. I'll put in with you. That Fuller woman has got to know a lot more than she's telling us. Well, she's got a perfect out. She was drunk. The bartender swears to it. Well, that story's phony. It's got more holes than a piece of cheese. Whose car did she pass out in? Who drove her home? Who called her this morning to tell her that her boyfriend was dead? Hit and run felony, Smith. Oh, yeah, Rogers. Yeah. You did, huh? What's his name? I see. Yeah, we'll check it out right away. Rogers, he and McClendon are still out at the bar. Finally got somebody to talk a little. Yeah, what'd they get? The bar boy out there. Says there was a fight. Happened about 1.30. Doesn't remember who was fighting, though. That's not much help, is it? The bar boy's name is Milner. He told Rogers he went outside about 20 minutes to 2 to put out the garbage. He saw the Fuller woman asleep in a car parked outside. Did he know the car? Did he get the license number? No, but he spotted something on the windshield. Yeah. A traffic ticket. <laughs> Frank and I checked with the sergeant of the watch at 77th Street Division. He told us unit 12A5 was assigned to the area where the brown barrel was located. In checking their worksheet, we found that unit 12A5 had issued a hang-on citation the night before to a car parked near 6330 and a half Vermont Avenue, the address of the brown barrel tavern. We checked the license number through RDMV and we found the car was registered to a William R. Huddy, 14 Naylor Street. We drove to the Naylor Street address and talked to Huddy's wife. She told us we could find him in a bar on South Olive Street. 8.55 p.m., we checked in at the bar. The bartender told us that the lone man at the shuffleboard table was William Huddy. Your name William Huddy? Yeah, that's right. Police officers want to talk to you for a minute. Oh, what about? I'd like to ask you a few questions. What's the matter? Nothing. We just want to talk to you. Yeah, all right. Were you at the Brown Barrel Tavern out in Vermont last night, Huddy? Yeah, I was. Why? What's the matter? Do you know her, Marion Fuller? Yeah, she hangs around the place. Goes with a guy named Eddie. Did you drive her home last night? Yeah, matter of fact, I did. She passed out in my car. Nice kid, but she drinks a lot. I drove her home. You mind telling us what happened at that bar last night while you were there? Well, it was a pretty funny setup there. I came in about 9 o'clock, started playing shuffleboard with a couple of guys. They said Eddie Stokes was one of them. Yeah. Well, Eddie's not much of a player. He drinks too much, too hothead. Got in a beef with the guy at the bar over Marion. Nothing big, though. The guy left after a while. All right, go ahead. Well, that's about all. I left the place around 1.30. Eddie was beefing with some merchant seaman about that time. Real hot beef. Eddie was choosing him. He was giving the guy a bad time. Was the Fuller girl still in the bar at that time? No, but when I went outside, I saw her sleeping in my car. I drove her home, left her off, and then came back to the bar. That's when they told me. Told you what? They said Eddie had a fight with this merchant seaman. They said it'd be better if we kept it quiet. Who told you that? Carl, the bartender. But I got the real story from one of the fellows I was playing shuffleboard with, Leo McCarty. What'd he tell you? Oh, he said when Eddie Stokes left, the merchant seaman followed him out, said he chased Eddie. McCarty went out about five minutes later. Yeah. The merchant seaman was gone. Stokes was lying in the gutter down the street. Did McCarty look at him? Yeah, I said Stokes looked pretty bad. Said he looked like he was dead. But I wouldn't believe that if I were you. 
Why not? McCarty always exaggerates. Ten fifteen p.m. We had William Huddy come back to the office with us where we questioned him further and took his statement. Then we had his friend, Leo McCarty, brought in along with the bartender at the Brown Barrel Tavern and the customers that he'd framed his story with. McCarty was the first to give us the straight story, then the others followed. The bartender, Carl Jansen, who also owned the bar, was the last to break. How about it? What do you mean? Now look, Jansen, you could have given us a straight story the first time. But what about the publicity? Now how would that look, a murder in my place? Yeah, well it could work out worse than that, Jansen. You've been withholding evidence. You talked these people into the same deal. I had to protect myself. I would have ruined my bar, the newspapers, all the talk, the scandal, to correct my business. I had to keep it quiet. Look, it's not my fault Stokes was killed. I didn't do it. I'm not to blame. No, but you know who is to blame. Now how about it? Who is he? He works on the ships. He comes in here most of the time when he's in port. What's his name? Henry Baxter. I care some of his paychecks. Just a minute. Hit and run felony detail Friday. Who? Yeah, he's here. Yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Jansen. Yeah. Yeah, Frida. Oh, just a minute. Uh, Sergeant? Yeah. It's my wife. She's at the bar now. She thought you ought to know. What's that? Henry Baxter. Frida says he just came in. I talked to Jansen's wife and told her to delay Baxter as long as possible without arousing his suspicions. 11.25 p.m., Frank and I and Mr. Jansen, along with Rogers and McClendon, drove out to the Brown Barrel Tavern on Vermont. Mrs. Jansen was waiting for us. She told us that Baxter was pretty drunk by that time. She'd been keeping an eye on him, and she said that she knew he was still inside the place. Rogers and McClendon went around to cover the back entrance. We asked Mrs. Jansen to go back in the bar and give no indication that anything was wrong. She told us approximately where Baxter was sitting. We waited a couple of minutes until we were sure Rogers and McClendon were in position at the back of the bar. Then we went in. him over there. Fell in the gray suit? Yes, sir. Closest table. Wait up. Wait up. Give me another coke guy. Will you ask it twice? That's him. You stay here. You're the waiter. Give me another coke guy. Your name Henry Baxter? What do you want to know for? Police officer. Stand up. Come on, get up. Put your hands on the table. Flat. I want to do it on a cigarette. Put it down. Come on, flat. Jansen. Yes, sir. If you go around back and tell those other two officers to meet us up front. Yes, sir. Hands in back. Come on, get the other one back there. All right. What's this all about, anyway? What's the beef? You know what the beef is. Yeah. Lousy punk Eddie Stokes, wasn't it? It was him. I showed him how it was done. Yeah. How'd you kill him, Baxter? It was easy. I slugged him. Pounded his head on the curb. He was drunk. Never know what happened. All right, let's go. Trying to give me a bad time. Now he knows. He knows what a bad time really is. I show him. All right, come on, Baxter. Outside. Come on, he can walk better than that. A lousy punk, Eddie Stokes. I showed him how it was done, didn't I? I showed him. Yeah, you showed him. Come on. Thanks, Jansen. Yes, sir. You fellas want to take him downtown? Hey, Joe. Yeah. How's the tooth? The what? The tooth, the wisdom tooth. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Doesn't hurt anymore. Pain's gone. You gotta see that dentist. I don't see why. Doesn't hurt anymore. I don't know. I'll look into it next week, huh? Got a piece of news for you. Got an appointment for you tonight. I got a little something for you. You don't know what time it is. You know it's almost midnight. No dentist in the world will work on you at this hour of the night. Mine will. On July 30th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The 
suspect was tried and convicted of manslaughter, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not to exceed 10 years.